back when. So it's, it's, it's in a family, it's just related to phenols. It's like a phenol. But the, uh, you don't have to memorize this table, just know in general, that's how these chemicals work, okay? Good question, thank you for asking. Anybody else got a question? It helps everyone else. So she asked a question and now, however many of you are in here, 25 or so, of you now have <laughs> one or possibly two questions that are on the lecture exam. So thank you, what you got, Kevin? Uh, for chapter seven, number four. Okay. How can Okay, great, so chapter seven, question number four, guys. It's about decimal reduction time, okay? So I'm just showing you where in the notes this comes from. Okay, so the decimal reduction time is the time that it takes for the population to be dis, uh, decreased by one log. So that means, for example, if you start out with a million, what's another way of writing a million, guys? I don't want to write a bunch of zeros. I would put 10 to the a million. Six. Six, thank you. Okay, so that's a million cells. So if you have a million cells, in the span of a decimal reduction time, that is gonna to go to 10 to the fifth which then another decimal reduction time will take it down to 10 to the fourth. So each of these is a D period. So different organisms get killed off faster. Some organisms are, are hard to kill and it takes longer to kill them. Think of it that way, okay? So the sensitive organisms die sooner. The resistant organisms die slow and it takes a long time to kill them. So if you remember from the videos, I took this curve and I showed you, essentially this is a death curve. That's what this is. That, that means you're going from 10 to the eighth, to 10 to the sixth, to 10 to the sixth, to 10 to the fifth. So each time you're losing 90% of the population, okay? So sometimes students have trouble with this math. They try this. What's another way of saying this? A hundred. Okay. So one decimal reduction would take you to ten to the. What's another way of saying that? Ten. Okay. So students get this thing of ninety percent. That's a hundred goes down to ten. That's what these are too. Okay. So these are just bigger numbers. So some of the students have trouble getting that this is actually ninety percent of the population is killed. They get it here that 90% of the population is killed, but they think, well, you still have you know, 10,000 cells. Yeah, 90% of the population is killed with each decimal reduction time. So getting back to how D can be used to compare organisms, this is straight out of the lecture, I gave you three curves. I showed you two other organisms, one that was very resistant and its curve, death curve, was a slope that's you know not as steep as this one. It was kind of out here. And then I showed you another one whose curve, death curve, was much more steep. So and then I wrote on here what the decimal reduction time for each of them are. So if the curve is like this, the decimal reduction time is longer, bigger. That means the organism is more resistant. So the bigger the D time, the more resistant the organism is. The smaller the D time, that means you can kill them off really fast, the more sensitive they are. So if I asked you a question and bing, 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 it's on the test, some version of this is on the test, <laughs> you would know that if an organism A had a D time of 20 minutes, and organism B had a D time of five minutes, which one is more sensitive? The first one or the second one? Second one. Second one. Okay, so that's, that's how they're used to compare. So you take these organisms and you see how fast you can kill them off. A long, big D time means they're really tough. It's hard to kill them. And a short D time,
time means they're really sensitive and you can just knock them off easily. Does that make sense? So it's just the general principle there I'd like you to, to understand. Okay. So you might have noticed when you came in the room here, it smelled a little bleachy, and that's because Anita, <laughs> Anita and I share, we both used to be in a former life, we both used to be CLSs, okay? So some of you went to the MLT thing. So the MLTs are, in labs there's like the phlebotomists, then there's the MLTs, and then there are the CLSs or MLS, depending on how you say it. And then there's like the pathologists and all that kind of stuff. So Anita and I both used to work in clinical labs. And so she did a little extra cleaning here today, just she's probably gonna do that for a while. <laughs> Um, but bleach is something we used to use a lot. We used to use it a lot in the clinical setting because it's really effective. So it'll kill hepatitis viruses, it'll kill a lot of um, naked viruses that don't have an envelope that are harder to kill. I don't know if you pick that up in the video. So a naked virus doesn't have an envelope and they're harder to kill. So bleach even kills that. So it turns out the coronavirus is an enveloped virus, and you don't really need bleach to kill it. You know, alcohol is pretty good for that because it disrupts the envelope. If it doesn't have an envelope, it can't do what stage of the viral replication requires that envelope? Attachment, the very first step. So if you use alcohol, you disrupt the envelope and it can't attach to cells, okay? So uh, bottom line is Anita and I, you know, I think she, she looked, I would say, went overboard, but she's being extra cautious and she's using the big guns out here uh, to dis disinfect everything, okay? So you can disinfect even against the most resistant organisms with bleach, okay? So let's go back to questions. That's good. Thank you, Kevin, for asking that. You guys, thank you for doing this. It's helpful. You got another question for me, Madison. What you got? Um, for chapter 12, question 6, specifically the um, last structure mentioned. Okay, sorry. Uh, question 12, which one again? Uh, chapter 12, question 6, in the very last structure. Oh, a cyst versus a trophozoite. Thank you. Okay, so. Uh, a cyst is a sort of protected stage of the organism. So a cyst is kind of like a spore, but in bacteriology, but it's not really. So a cyst versus a trophozoite. So a cyst versus a trophozoite. So the cyst is protected. The trophozoite is more metabolically active. So sometimes we shorten that and just call this a troph stage. So the troph stage is usually the, um, the modal stage that can crawl around. It's metabolically active. The troph stage is like that. The cyst stage is more of a resting stage. So let's see if we can pull up the parasitology and you, you might have noticed, ooh, parasitology, oh my gosh, there's a whole lot of stuff you probably haven't had before, so you, you gotta work this stuff, guys. Uh, but let's pull up cyst versus tro, fungi, protists, blah, 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 here we go. So I'm just showing you where in the notes it is. I don't know if this helps you, but when I was a student, I like went over the notes a bunch of times, and then I would like make my own sort of condensed version of notes or flashcards or something. But sometimes it, students are visual and they kind of remember like where in the pages it was. So I'm trying to, to help people that are think that way. So here's the troph or trophozoite stage, modal, metabolically active, have a soft pellicle. Whereas the cyst stage is the sort of thick wall protected stage. It's essentially a dormant stage that the cell goes into to survive. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. So I'm just kind of showing you where in the notes that stuff appeared. So good, thank you for asking that. Who else has got a question? Anybody, what you got? A question in the parasitology um, section. It's okay. Worms. Worms. Those guys. Those little wormy 
guys. Okay, so hopefully you know that a vector is usually an insect, okay? A vector is not the same as an intermediate host. Say that again. A vector is not the same as an intermediate host. A vector is usually an insect that will bite one person with an infectious agent and then transfer it to the other, okay? So uh, the classic vectors are mosquitoes, but there are others like ticks, fleas, those are other uh, classic vectors. So uh, the two protozoan diseases that had a vector, I did talk about those in lecture. So the, you, there's a lot of them, but the ones that I talked about that are kind of classic are, what disease is this here? Plasmodium. Malaria is the disease. I'm just seeing how you go there. Malaria is the disease. The etiologic agent, somebody said plasmodium. Yay. <laughs> how do you get malaria? How do you get infected with the organism, which is called plasmodium? Well, you, you get bitten by a vector. That vector is the mosquito. Okay, so hopefully that rings a bell. And then I also talked about another disease that has a vector, uh, and that is, the genus name is Trypanosoma. It actually causes two really important diseases that are found in different parts of the world and have different vectors. So let's try this. How many of you before these videos had heard of African sleeping sickness? Anybody here? Sometimes, sometimes students have heard of that. That's caused by a member of the trypanosoma uh, genus, and it's transmitted by a vector called the tsetse fly. Okay. So I, I, again, I'm hoping you have this in your notes so you can get that from there. Then the other one is, is actually geographically more common in this part of the world. It's called Chagas disease. How many of you, before you took this class, had heard of Chagas disease? Very few. So it's really common in South America and Central America. Uh, and because we have a lot of people coming from those countries, it's pretty common here, way more common than African sleeping sickness. So Chagas disease is another one. Uh, and Chagas disease, I'm looking at Madison, but actually I didn't ask the question, sorry. Um, Chagas disease is transmitted by what's sometimes called the kissing bug, that's the common name, or the reduvid bug, reduvid bug, that's the, kind of the fancy name. So this is in your notes. For, as far as helminths, which you had trouble pronouncing, which is okay, because I mispronounce things. I just say it with authority and my students think I know what I'm talking about. Um, no, I've had, you know, I've been, I'm a product of the UC system and we have a lot of professors who come from all parts of the world. So their pronunciation on things is always, I don't know, so I just try it the way I want it sounded easiest for me to say. So anyway, um, I'm not a stickler on pronunciation. So for a worm disease that has a vector, you gotta go to the book. So this was not talked about in lecture. So I'm glad you asked it though, because it's bing, bing, bing on the lecture exam. You guys are asking good questions here today. So, okay, uh, so one of them, a lot of students have heard of this, and I'm not gonna ask you to know the genus name. Uh, dog heartworm. Anybody heard of dog heartworm? Any, I'm a dog owner. Okay. So what's that? It was on the test? It was on the quiz. On the quiz. Yeah. Well now you know it's on the lecture exam. So dog heartworm is something, if you look in, in chapter whatever, 12, I think it's chapter 12, this uh, parasitology, you'll see a picture of a dissected dog heart that looks like a human heart and it's full of worms. So it's transmitted by a mosquito, so a mosquito vector, okay. So uh, another one, a lot of you have learned about this in your anatomy classes. So how many of you have heard of the term elephantiasis? It's, by the way, it's not elephantitis. It's elephantiasis, but don't worry, it's a multiple choice question, okay. So elephantiasis is a disease that is caused by a small worm that's transmitted by mosquitoes. So people that get elephantiasis get this teeny tiny worm, it's called a microfilarial worm, that end, 
ends up getting into lymph vessels. So those of you who've had anatomy you know there's a whole parallel system of vessels next to the blood vessels, but the, this parallel system is a one-way system of vessels bringing fluid back into the blood supply. Those are called lymphatics or lymph vessels. And if you got a worm in your lymph vessel, it's going to plug it up and fluids are starting to build up. So if you, you know, Google elephantiasis, you're going to see pictures of people with usually lower limbs, sometimes a scrotum too, uh, usually lower limbs that are just giant, like an elephant's limb. And that's because it's just full of fluids because of a teeny tiny worm, it's a microscopic worm that is transmitted by mosquitoes. So that's a tricky one. That's one you have to get out of the book. So that's a hard one. I'm glad you asked it. Everyone should say thank you, Damon, for asking that question because it's on the test. Elephantiasis and dog uh, heartworm. So from the lectures, you could get the other two. Okay. Thanks for asking that. Okay. Anybody else got a question from here? So there was there was a bit. I, I understand this. It's a little overwhelming. So you just work on it and do the best you can. Um, I was going to ask the difference between oncogenes and pro oncos. Okay, so in, in the virology section, I just talk a little bit about how a virus can sometimes lead to cancer. So I, I'm going to just do a little preface for this. So a, a virus sometimes, when it gets into the host DNA, it can cause that host cell to divide, divide, and divide. So uh, a lot of students have heard of one particular virus that's associated with cancer. So what, what have you heard of? What's a virus that's associated, that's associated with cancer, guys? Can anybody think about it? HPV. HPV. That's the one that most students like have heard of, okay? So HPV is one. Epstein-Barr is one that I talk about in the lectures because it's, its mechanism has been really well known, whereas HPV, they don't really know exactly how that works. Um, so in the virology section, I talk a little bit about that. Uh, and I also talk just about cancer sort of in general. So, uh, so oncogenic viruses, I gave some examples here. I talk about HPV, HPV, and not HPV, but uh, Epstein-Barr, sorry, and Burkitt's lymphoma. So they, they've known this mechanism since even when I was in college, not so long time ago. <laughs> okay, so, but what you, you're asking about the difference between a proto-oncogene and an oncogene, correct? Okay. Mm -hmm. So a oncogene, oncogene is a mutant gene that promotes unchecked cell growth. So normally cells have checks on when they go through division. So if a virus gets into one of your cells and brings an oncogene, it is cancer causing. So the, the term oncogene literally means cancer causing or cancer generating. Okay. So the other one is called a proto-oncogene. Proto means like before, like a prototype is before you actually build the car, you make a model out of, you know, clay or something and you say, hey, what do you think about this new car? So a proto-oncogene is a gene that is actually a normal gene. But if it gets disrupted by a virus inserting itself into that gene, the cell will start dividing like crazy. Okay, so a proto-oncogene is a normal gene that controls cell growth and division. And if a virus puts its genetic information somewhere in the middle of that gene and mess that gene up, then the cell will continue to grow. Okay. <coughs> so Crystal, this is where this comes from, this, this part of the notes. You don't have to know it in great detail. The, you know, the biology of cancer is a really cool and interesting thing. But There are viruses associated with cancer, including uh, the hepatitis B and C viruses. This is not on test, but hepatitis B and C, I don't think it's on the test, cause, uh, is associ are associated with liver cancer. 
Uh, you guys mentioned HPV, that's associated with cervical cancer, anal cancers. Uh, let's see, what's other? Uh, I mentioned Epstein-Barr virus and Burkitt's lymphoma. And you might know that, that people that have uh, HIV, the virus HIV, uh, will suppress the immune system and then as a result of the immune system being suppressed, then they are susceptible to other weird cancers, including uh, things like Kaposi's sarcoma, which is a skin cancer. But anyway, um, so, so viruses, you know, uh, sometimes can, can trigger cancers in different ways. Yeah? Uh, speaking of HIV, in the table, so it says uh, that HIV is in a class of DNA producing, so it is I know it's a retrovirus, but is it a DNA virus? It's considered an RNA virus. Okay. okay. So all of those are based on, inside the capsid, what kind of genetic information is in there. Okay. So actually, when in doubt, guess the virus is an RNA virus, because more, more viruses actually that are known have been studied. I mean, there's, there's a lot of we don't know, but from what we know, most viruses actually use RNA as their genetic information. And the retroviruses, including uh, HIV, do use RNA. That means inside their capsid, that's what's in there. Okay. So the, uh, I think I mentioned this the other day, that the, the um, COVID virus is an RNA virus. And it is a positive strand. You guys remember what that means? I think there's a question in the test. What's a positive strand RNA virus versus a negative strand? Anybody know what a positive strand? What does that mean? It's like a plus sign. It can start transcribing or translating. It can start translation right away. That viral RNA is an mRNA. The viral RNA is an mRNA. That means it doesn't have to be transcribed. So let's just show you kind of where that is here. Plus strand. RNA, the, the genome RNA, that means what's inside the capsid. Remember that all viruses have some kind of genetic information, DNA or RNA, depending on what family it is. Then there's a protein capsid outside of that, always. And then sometimes in envelope viruses, there's an envelope on the outside. But the genome RNA is what's inside that capsid. Okay, so plus strands can immediately act as a messenger RNA. Then it can be like translated right away. All right, so anybody else got a question here? And yes, you know, uh, what you got? I was wondering if you can do a generation time example. Okay, generation time. And, and on the test, if I ask you that, and I will, ding, 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 you, you should be able to figure them out. They're not super hard. Like, I don't, I try not to make them really big numbers. But what you have to remember for those is the general, whoopsie, uh, let's just go, what's the, the general equation here? And that's from right here, okay? So it is the number of cells that you start out with. So the question will say, do you have five E. coli cells, or two E. coli cells, or one E. coli cells. So the number of cells at the start, at the start, let's we'll see, okay, times two to the N. So what is N? Number of generations. The number of generations, okay, so if I said, okay, you start out with four cells and you go through three generations, how many cells would you have at the end of that? So you'd say, okay, four cells to the start, two, to, it's always two to the something. What did I say, three generations? Yeah. Okay, so what is that? What is that equal to? That is equal to two times two times two times two times two is four times two is eight. So it's four times eight, or the answer is 32. Okay? So that's if I was feeling really nice, you know, had some chocolate in the morning with my coffee. 
Uh, but I might be a little trickier, not a lot trickier, but I might say, okay, if you know that E. coli has a generation time of 20 minutes, and I use that because E. coli's generation time is 20 minutes, and we always use E. coli as our example. That means every 20 minutes, it goes through one generation time. If you know that, and you put one E. coli cell in culture for two hours, how many would be there after that two hour period? Okay, so here we go again. One times two to the, oh, how do I figure this out, <laughs> okay? So what did I say? I said two hours, okay? So you think, okay, in two hours, you can do it in your head or you can do it by math. In two hours, how many 20-minute periods will take place? Six. Six, okay? So if you can't figure that out, you say two hours is 120 minutes, and each generation time is 20 minutes per generation. So then you go, oh, that's equal to six generations. And then you take this six and you put it into this slot here. So two to the six is, oh my gosh, higher math. Let's see if we can figure it out here. So it's two times two times two times two. You can do it on your hands or you can write it out, okay? So if you're doing that, one more here. One, two, three, four, five, six. So two times two is four, eight, 16, 32, 64. 64 cells at the end of that time period. Does that make sense, Crystal? So I won't make a big, a really huge number because I'm not going to let you have a calculator. Okay. So that's just because it opens the door. Okay. We got, we got to move on here to lab here pretty quick. But anybody got a last question here from the study guide or otherwise? What you got? Just a generalized question in regards to number 11 for sure. Okay. Yeah, genus name, disease, and transmission. There's not a whole lot of questions, but there are a few. So you, can, you know, for example, hmm, genus names, uh, within the nematodes, the, I gave four examples, okay? And those are because students have heard of them. Maybe I didn't get a whole big response, but how many of you have heard of pinworm again? It's pretty common in the U.S. So, for example, a common name of a, of a roundworm disease includes pinworm, and it, it's caused by the genus Enterobius. Enterobius. And how do you get that? You have a little preschool age kid, is what you, have, what you do. It's, it's oral fecal route which, sorry, little kids, usually preschool kids, are not so great with their hygiene. And then they, one of the kids at a preschool will get it. And then the, there's like thousands of eggs that get laid every night. And then the little kid is touching things and touching things and other kids touch things. <laughs> so it's fecal oral route and, you know, don't touch your face. Um, anyway, so uh, bottom line is, that's an answer to your question, yes. Okay. Yeah. And there's no class for nematode, nematoda? No. Okay. Correct. Just, you just need to know the phylum name, nematoda. There are classes, but you don't need to know them. Okay. All right, so you guys got to study, study, study. It's going to rain tomorrow. You all should be studying, studying, studying. Hopefully you're not waiting till tomorrow to study. But um, So we have a couple of uh, carryover labs, and we're hopefully to the stage where most of you have both your unknowns on slants. So I'm going to be coming around early in lab, and I'm going to be looking at your unknown slants. How many of you, do you guys remember, did you put your gram positive on a slant last time? A lot of you streaked out and then you put it on a slant. So I'm gonna be looking at those. Uh, and then I'm gonna be having you do the two labs that we set up. So what were the two labs we set up last time? Motility and oxygen requirements, okay? So let's just do a little quick review because 